Kathy, thank you for joining the show. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. How are you? I am great. I am great. Where are you talking from today? Um, beautiful New Jersey. New Jersey? Is New Jersey yeah. that beautiful? Listen, we have beaches, mountains, city, country. We have it all. It's an oasis, really. Yeah. What'd you say? Y'all yeah, lost the basketball team. <laughs> but we also have Lauren Hill, so. Okay. And Joe Buddy. And Whitney Houston. Nice. Okay. All right. Okay. I get it. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for coming on today. You know, uh, this is my most anticipated episode because I need questions answered and the book answered every single question that I have. You are the author of Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah, which will be out in stores today when this episode releases. Uh, first, can we talk about you and your journey in this media world? You've worked at XXL, The Source, uh, The Village, Cosmopolitan, all that, all those good companies. Can you talk about how all of that shaped you into writing this book? Well, I think having written for so many places, um, you know, being a freelance writer, you're always having to find the story, right? And, and trying to figure out what it is that you want to write about. So being a writer for so long, now rounding out my, geez, my, my 22nd year, um, mm -hmm. I think it allows you to go deeper into a story too. Because if you think about, you know, one specific subject, let's say you've covered something, you know, in January and it's still quite relevant by April or May and you're writing about it again, it um, allows you to look at it from a different angle and look at things a little deeper. And, you know, when it comes to Aliyah, the story has been so open-ended. You know, there's so many different unanswered questions that as fans and even as people in the music industry, like we've always just wondered about. And, you know, coming up on the 20th anniversary of her passing, I felt that now was a good time to really honor her and also tell the story of um, how this incredible artist became an icon even after her passing. Right, right. And I'm so grateful that you did because I did feel like people were, they're not, she's not talked about every single day. It's clear as day, that's not happening. But I just didn't want people to forget her legacy in total. You know, like she did leave an impact for a lot of these young artists as we can see with like the Normani and the cash dolls and all that. Yeah. yeah and, and she is, she's brought up a lot by Aliyah fans. Like the Aliyah fan hive is real, you know, team Aliyah and they call it like themselves Aliyah's angels and young nation. Like there's all these like little um, subgroups of, of um, the Aliyah fan base. That's keeping her legacy alive. But I think, What's starting to happen is she's become such an inspiration to so many different people that everyone's forgetting to honor her. She's just become, uh, the influence is so strong that it's almost become anonymous because it's so obvious. And it's a little bit interesting how there's a lot of people who don't understand that through line to which they are connected to Aliyah, you know, even tangentially um, in style and sound and everything. Like so many things point back to her, even if it's not a direct sample of her music. Right. Right. So let, let's talk about her. Let's talk about the beginning of the book. It talks about how, you know, she was born in or Brooklyn and she, she grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she found her uh, ability to sing at a very early age. Yes. I mean, she was, you know, Aliyah was one of those children who kind of knew, I think, inside that she wanted to be a star, but also that music. Um, entertainment more specifically was her chosen path. And, and she recognized that at like eight, nine years old. Nice. And it, this is something that she wanted to fully pursue or was she getting pressure from her like family members? I wouldn't necessarily call it pressure. You know, she came from a family where, you know, her, um, her mother was um, also, you know, part of a theater company before she had her children and her uncle, you know, Barry Hankerson um, had been married to Gladys Knight and, you know, he was working his way in the music industry. And I don't necessarily think that it was something where, you know, 
you're talking about stage parents kind of like forcing her onto a stage. I think Alia very much wanted to be a part of that world. And she was lucky enough to have kind of like this network of people around her who were her family members who could assist and, and you know, nurture that. Um, so, so, you know, she was part of like local theater quite early. She was doing a lot of things in her school. And, you know, of course, going on Star Search and then um, doing a, a small tour with um, Gladys Knight. You know, these were all things that happened before Aliyah was even a teenager. But it was just having this network of incredible people who kind of wanted to usher her along. Nice, nice. Yeah, and, you know, it's not every day you can say that my aunt is Gladys Knight. <laughs> right, right. Like, something, yeah, something magic was going to be made in the Alden family. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. 100%. Um, so uh, when did she start to travel with her Uncle Barry, you know, just to start like singing with music labels, executives? Well, before she was even a teenager, you know, her uncle wanted her to get a record deal and most of the labels thought she was too young, you know. Um, there was talent there, obviously, everyone recognized it, but they just felt like she was too young. So he made his own thing, you know. He and his uh, son Jomo formed Black Round and you know, as as it would turn out, Barry was already managing another artist, R. Kelly, who had a deal with Jive. So there was kind of this point where as soon as Aliyah became a teenager and R. Kelly was reaching his prime in his career, even on the, the first uh, solo album, it, it, the two worlds were able to come together rather smoothly because Aliyah was at an age at that point where labels weren't seeing her as too, too young. Barry already had this kind of relationship with Jive through his artist. So, um, you know, they were able to combine forces and, you know, get Aliyah out there. Right. Now I don't want to I don't want to put too much attention on the situation. We both know what happened. We both saw the documentaries in 2019. We've sure. been hearing about the stories throughout the years. Uh -huh. There was so much controversy around her first album, "Age Ain't Nothing But a Number." But uh, mm -hmm. some, some highlights for the album were "Back and Forth," uh, "At Your At Your Best" is another one. There were some mm -hmm. good singles from that. What was the attitude around? with Aaliyah's team around her first album, Age Ain't Nothing But A Number, with everything going on. You said the team or the industry? Her and their team. How did they, they, yeah, they, they react to the sales for that album with all the controversy? Well, I don't think one had really anything to do with the other at the time, because remember, Aaliyah's first project came out and then later it was widely publicized what had been going on behind the scenes. So I don't think it helped bolster anything really. I think Aliyah's talent and the nature of the project is what propelled her to be the star. And she kind of hit a ceiling once everything came to light because unfortunately, you know, when everyone kind of found out what had gone on with the, the doctored uh, birth certificate and, and the, um, the marriage, which is only the tip of the iceberg of what actually, you know, went down. You know, once Aliyah separated herself from R. Kelly, going into um, One in a Million was not easy for her. And you're talking about someone who was 15, 16 years old. So, yeah. you know, she was getting booed for leaving his side, you know. They had mental health. She was probably... She, you could say she was one of the early poster childs in mental health because that was a rough stretch for her, you know, after that first album and, you know, producers not wanting to work with her and her pretty much being blackballed in a way. Yeah. And I, you know, we don't give her enough credit for how resilient she was in going yeah. into that second project. We don't give her enough credit. We don't give the community that Missy and Timberland gave her enough credit, you know, there, there was there was a sense of comfort in in um, in meeting people like Symbol and Missy, especially given what they came from in working with Swing Mob. You know, they had their own set of trauma, you know, traumatic experiences working with Swing Mob. So there's, I would hate to call it like this community based on trauma, but it's like understanding each other in a very different way, um, and in doing so being less risk averse, right? 
because mm -hmm. you're coming from situations where you, when you walked out, you weren't sure if you were going to make it after that. So you right. have a bunch of individuals, you know, for the first half of one in a million, it's really just piecemealed based upon who they could grab to work with Aliyah, considering the fact that so many producers didn't want to based on the, the strength of the situation with R. Kelly. So the first half of the project is really just kind of pieced together. The second half, where it, which is touched by Miss Missy and Timbaland, um, there's a real energy there, there's synergy. Not to say that those other tracks aren't great, because they are, but there's a synergy there because, you know, they became like this little family. So, but there was a risk. There was, a, there's a risk and the sound was a risk. Everything was so risky with the second half of that project. And I'm saying second half, but you know what I mean? The second portion of it separate from what was piecemealed together. So you have this whole, this, this chunk of this project that is so sonically risky. It's so fundamentally different from what we know to be defined as R&B music, right? And it's mm -hmm. coming from an artist who was made to feel like she couldn't make it after leaving the side of an abuser. And then from two, a, a brilliant songwriter and producer and a brilliant producer who left the camp of uh, an abusive camp and thinking they might not make it either. All of them, they, they just threw caution to the wind and the result completely changed R&B music as we know it. So I think that the definition, to go back to your um, earlier question, the definition of the team is what I think evolved for Aliyah. So there was the perception is really relative because you're, you're talking about teams that went like this, right? It, her mm -hmm. first team was her and R. Kelly. So mm -hmm. there was no team. There was only an I, and that I was Robert, you know, um, and Aliyah kind of taking cues, uh, being a child. And then you go into one in a million, and the team became Missy, Timbaland, and Aliyah. And, you know, we, uh, well, Static later came on through the soundtrack and then in uh, soundtracks and then into the um, final Aliyah project. But you're talking about this like community that they found within each other that right. where they were they were able to just do so much and nobody judged the other about where they came from right and, and it's still it's a beautiful story to this day how they have just grown like this friendship from again from the um, trauma that she's faced in her first you mm -hmm. know her first album like it's still a beautiful thing to this day and i feel their pain every time they just like choke up just thinking about her and they talk about her spirit just being there like that's how you know like she was like very special to them very 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 special very so with everything leading up to it was the second album uh was there pressure for the second album like or was it going to be considered a bust if she didn't perform I mean, there's always pressure for the sophomore curse, right? I mean, it, and even if you change up your entire team, the pressure doesn't change, really. Um, if anything, it gets worse. And given where Aliyah had come from, of course, then the, the pressure would be on for her. But, you know, the period of uncertainty when you're talking about 1995 going into 1996, where she took, um, you know, she, she went overseas and, and, and started, you know, charting overseas and, and doing her tour and all this other stuff, you know, coming back around and getting into the studio and figuring out this second project. I think that the biggest pressure was what, what do you do when your mentor is not by your side any longer, you know? As damaging as that relationship was, there is a sense of comfort in your creative partnership. So what yeah. do you do when you're no longer in this comfort zone of sitting in a studio with one person? You know, now you're in a studio with multiple producers, multiple songwriters, you know, multiple other artists. And, and you're just, you know, you're still a child at the end of the day. And so... There's, I think there was a lot of growing pains going into that project, but, you know, Aliyah just seemed to <laughs> just magically, it was like they didn't matter. It, they didn't exist. And I think what we also started to see was um, the building aesthetically of an icon, 
you know, um, starting to work with, um, you know, her stylist, Derek, and, you know, doing these things where she was coming into her own. And, and we really see that in the one in a million video, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. um, where we just like, you know, just see just this artist coming into her own. And it all comes full circle by the Aliyah project. Right, right. And the one in a million video is a, uh... It's a great video. And I remember there's like a rumor saying that she was laughing at the end. She was laughing at Genuine or something. I always thought that was pretty funny. Like she mm -hmm. couldn't she can hold her face straight or something like that. Yeah, and, and and they just have it was like this the the relationship between everyone. There was just a lot of love there, you know, and and, and a lot of good times and and you know the the community again, you know. Aliyah was a part of something by the time mm -hmm. that project came. And, and once you have that sense of real community, sometimes it allows you to find yourself too. You know, some people say, oh, I've got to leave the pack to find myself. But I think Aliyah had to join one to find herself because so yeah. much of her identity was being shaped by someone else to start. She had to find herself, yeah. Develop your own identity, it's normal. Um, so how do you think she would have impacted fashion today? Because there are reports that she wanted to start a fashion line with her friend, uh, Kadada, mm -hmm. Kadada Jones. Dolly so Pop, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is no question of if she impacted fashion today. She already did. If you look at, just look at the way artists dress today, they're still dressing like Aliyah. Uh, Tommy Hilfiger just, um, you know, rolled out another line that was inspired by Aliyah. Um, her nine, her uh, 1996 campaign, 95, 95, yeah, 95, 96, <laughs> that era, 97. Yeah. I'm trying to remember that. I mean, I, because from the moment she was in the commercial to the ad that was sitting in my locker in high school, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, um, add it up. But during that stretch of time, you know, Aliyah's fashion sense, I mean, there's, everyone dresses like Aliyah still, you know, mm -hmm. like that's, there's, she impacted fashion. She didn't need her own clothing line to do it. You know, her style is still everywhere. So right. it's, it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, to see how so many people still dress like Aliyah. It just, it's just wild. Right. After, after that second album, we can see that her world is opening up more. She's meeting new people, different people. She's met, again, she's met the likes of uh, Quincy Jones' daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, also her friend who's a model and detain, Adcock. Mm -hmm. That's somebody else. Yeah. So, yeah, I asked that because, you know, she was really, she had the music thing down packed, but, you know, the fashion, she would have, her and Rihanna would have, you know, went head to head, I would say. Would you say? I mean, sure, but we also have to, I said sure, but we also have to remember the age difference had Aliyah been alive today. She would have been 41, yeah. 42. 42 years old. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, I could see her collaborating um, with artists like Rihanna, you know, maybe Beyonce, um, you know, I mean, she had choreographed for Destiny's Child in the past, but um, I'm not quite sure what, what Aliyah would have been doing right now. You know, she might've right. just went, went straight to Hollywood. You know, she may have, you know, done like how Queen Latifah has and, and been the full-time actor. You know, she was very much into that. You know, um, there there were, the sky was the limit for her. Right. Let's, let's shift it back to her family. I want to say what, 98, 99, she's finally finished high school. She graduates with a 4.0, you know, she's still focusing on her music. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you say about how, much her parents have pushed her to be as successful as she was. Well, I think, I think her parents, and I mean, she graduated in 97. So her parents were making sure that while the music was happening, the education was still important. You know, um, they've raised a well-rounded child. This isn't someone who, was just groomed for the stage and then had no concept of anything else in the outside world. You know, they, they, the, the child that they raised was, was an incredible human, but it was because they, they urged her to finish her education. She wanted to go to college at some point, 
you know, they urged her to pursue every part of her passions. Like, you know, when it, whether it was music, film, fashion, philanthropy, it, it was always just like, do you, we have faith in you. And they pushed her, um, not, they didn't push her in a direction. They pushed her into finding her direction. Mm -hmm. And brains, brains definitely runs in the family because her brother Rashad, was it true? He graduated from Hofstra. He's, he graduated yeah, I mean, from some prestigious know. school. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And the Houghtons are, you know, you know, her father um, is a businessman. Her mother's a teacher and worked in theater, um, was, uh, you know, performing in a theater company. So you have this balance of, you know, beauty, brains and creativity. Like it's, it runs in the family. Right. Okay. That's good. So let's shift it even more. So she graduates high school and then a couple years later, she's cast in her first film, Romeo Must Die, featuring Jet Li, DMX, Anthony Anderson, uh, her stylist Fatima, you know. Uh, how big was this for her career? Well, um, Fatima was her choreographer, but um, the Romeo Must Die was, um, it was pretty big because, there was a couple of reasons why that that mo movie was so big. First of all, nobody realized that Aliyah could act like that, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, how would they have known? Um, that movie really showed her acting potential. But then, of course, the track "Try Again," you yeah. know, "Try Again" was a beast. Like that song was, you know, when you think of where R&B music is now mm -hmm. and what it sounds like. So much of R&B sonically leans on what it was that Timbaland, um, Aaliyah, I believe Static was a part of that one, what, um, what they created, that mix of electronic and, you know, the, the synths and the, the, the heavy bass and, you know, just uh, the distorted like bass lines and, and the want want like all that like and, mm -hmm. and then just how Aliyah glides over that beat with her vocals you know there's so much that um that people are utilizing today so you know as much as the film was a huge deal for Aliyah as an actor that song was a huge deal for Aliyah as a musician right. And then one of the names I mentioned in the uh, film DMX, and we know mm -hmm. he's taken Aaliyah's death really hard, and he's actually passed away this year. Rest in peace to him. Rest in peace. Uh, how how much of an impact was it was his was her passing on his career? You know, well, first of all, Aaliyah was the one who went to DMX's dressing room to get him to be in Romeo Must Die, and mm -hmm. because of that you know, DMX had already been doing some acting, but he later um, went on and did more roles with the director of the film. And, you know, her passing deeply hurt DMX because he had a, what he felt was, was, and everyone saw it, was like a true connection, a true friendship with Aaliyah. You know, and we saw it in um, Come Back in One Piece. You know, um, Aliyah headed over to Yonkers and, you know, DMX was like so impressed by that, which I thought was really great. And when she passed away, you know, it, it hurt him, especially since, you know, you're talking about a man who was so deeply connected to God and you had someone like Aliyah who gave off this angelic quality. Um, so you had this angel on earth and she, she goes away and, you know, X who's very much, you know, just a, um, a God fearing man, you know, he felt it on a spiritual level. Yeah. And it's something that I think stayed with him. But also, Romeo Must Die was a blessing for him. And it came directly from Aaliyah. So it was like, you know, even in her passing, like later on, like there was, she managed that connection between the two of them, allowed him to take a piece of her with him throughout his acting career. Right. And we also know that. He was also a large voice in her music not being used by Drake and other artists as well. Um, mm -hmm. Was that, it, was he close with the Halton family? Was he like the, the mouthpiece for that family? So like if he, if he disapproved of something, was that uh, her mother disapproving of something as well? 
I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think that um, I think that when it comes to Aliyah's music, there's just a lot of um, there's a lot of gray areas, you know. And I think that um, there's no one person who can stand up and say um, my my okay is the only okay, my no is the only no. I think that you're talking about from a personal standpoint versus a legal standpoint. So a person who may really want the music to come out might not have the legal power to do that. And then the person who doesn't want it to come out might have all the legal power to do that. So there's a lot of um, unanswered questions when it comes to the fate of Aliyah's music. So I wouldn't necessarily say that like DMX was like the mouthpiece because in the same way, you can't say that Drake was the mouthpiece or, um, or 40, you know? Um, I think that there's a difference between the law and the family's wishes. Yeah. But also given the fact that so much of the legal red tape is also attached to family members, everything is just blurred. And it's just, like I said, a lot of gray areas. So I wouldn't necessarily say that someone, you know, agreeing that her music should um, not be sampled or, or not be reinterpreted is it necessarily just like a direct messenger from the family themselves. I, I, you can't like that. That's almost impossible to trace. And, and even so, what does it mean when it comes down to contracts? Right. Okay. I mean, I was just asking for an extra clarification because, you know, we see statements from the family, but not, you know, they put statements out here and there, you know, I'll I follow up with it. Yeah, I think I think it comes down to whether or not, you know, you're talking about someone's daughter. You're talking yeah. about someone's sister, right? Um, and the thing about Aliyah is she is so beloved by the world. And when someone passes away that you are close to that is loved by the world, there's almost a surrendering of a piece of that person to the rest of the world. And I think what's kind of happened with um, with Aliyah's legacy is fans have taken ownership of that legacy based mm. upon Aliyah, right? The artist. But Aliyah Houghton was someone's family member, right? So the hard part is when the gift that that human brought upon the world is the gift of music, and music isn't meant to stay in the person's bedroom by themselves, right? Mm -hmm. That's where it, things get tricky because that was her contribution to the world. That was her gift to the universe. So when you have all of these adoring fans who really just want to hear this music, it's very hard to say what is right and what is wrong in what they want to get, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, they're not, they're not, um, they're not, a they're asking for the piece of her that she chose to show everyone. That's, I mean, that's not, it's not, it's not a secret. Her music is not a secret. Like, it's not like, they're not asking for journal entries. They're asking for her music, music that's already been released. And if you can't have that music, they're asking for unreleased things that she was going to release anyway, or pieces of those unreleased works being reinterpreted and reimagined into something that they can listen to. It's just really, it's just really trying to feel closer to her. And I feel the most for, for these young fans. They never got to experience Aliyah in real time. You know, right. they, they learned I about her after she watching passed. The movie. My, yeah, my experience was watching the movie on TNT because back in the day, TNT would, the movie would come out and then like maybe months later, it would be on TNT just like Rush Hour. But yeah, my experience was watching her and Roman almost die, you know, with uh, Jet Li. You know, I, I was impressed. You know, nostalgia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, they, she, she is someone who was always ageless and always timeless. Even when you look at Aaliyah now, people just tend to feel that she's still their age. Yeah even if you're like a 13 year old or a 45 year old, for whatever reason you look at her and you think she's a peer. From the outside looking in, it seemed like she was very wise. She had the wisdom of like a 40 or 50 year old for someone who was so young. Yeah, I mean, she was an old soul and she was wise beyond her years. I mean, she experienced a lot within a chunk of time that most people, you know, 
don't really get to experience. Right. Right. So then let's transition to the last year of her life. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we find out that she's been cast in Queen of the Dam. She's been cast in The Matrix. She's working on her third and fi final album, uh, self-titled Aaliyah. How important was that last year for her? How important was it for her journey? It was a monumental year. You know, there was a lot that was happening in the way of um, all the different parts of her career because she was also hoping to release Dolly Pop with um, Kidada. You know, uh, there was a lot that was that was going on. And Queen of the Damned, you know, she was out in Australia with a whole new team at this point, you know, led by Static Major. Um, they were all out in Australia and there was a studio within walking distance of her hotel. So Aliyah was like filming during the day and then going to the studio at night. I mean, she was just, you know, it was just an all day ordeal for her. And she was just balancing her acting and her music career side by side. And this was the album that she was the most hands-on. She had the heaviest uh, input on this project. So that was a big deal. And then you're talking about everything that was going on in the way of her acting career. You know, um, she was gonna star in the next two Matrix films. So there's, there's that going on. And, you know, she was on the brink. She was on the verge. And yeah. God had other plans. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, her life got cut short. But And she also found love with uh, Damon Dash, who was Rockefeller business partner at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know, this because there's, there's, there's a lot of legal fighting going on right now. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to leave that title out there. I don't, I don't know what he was called. But how... Just from watching, how has he taken? How has he taken her passing? I'm I'm guessing he hasn't taken it well at all, and he's probably never going to recover from it. I mean, I think Dame. You know, now he's you know um, a husband and a father. You know, I think I think Dame has has found his happiness, but he never ever ever um, shies away from honoring Aliyah. Um, mm -hmm. Aliyah changed him. You know, when they were together. And I include some stories in the book of people who actually witnessed just how he changed, you know, for the better. But then he also influenced her. He he um he got her to loosen up a bit and live a little. So there was there was this um, mutual uh, kind of inspiration, you know, that that went on between the two of them. But there was there it was real. And and losing her, you know, did did affect Dame very negatively for a while until he had to make peace with it. Like like anybody who loses someone that they love, um, I think that their connection was definitely something that the world didn't recognize until you look back and you see those pictures of them together and you see just um, how they they looked at each other and 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 there was just real love there but the other thing was he was he protected her he was he was her protector and she needed to be protected and i think that that you know dame has been very vocal about how, how he lost her on the only day he wasn't able to protect her right right because you know it's a very from you know just from watching stories and reading and watching documentaries it's a very predatory music business. So, you know, that's the one, that's one of the great things I do like about Dame Dash is that he is a mm -hmm. protector. Like he talks about what he does, like he protects. And there's right. documented history of that. Right, absolutely. Summer, summer 2001, her final mm -hmm. album is released. How is her team reacting to the sales of this album? Well, you know, she was then um, at a new label. You know, she was at Virgin. And I mean, this was the, going to be the breakout album. This was the album that was going to, you know, set the tone for the next decade of her life. And I think, you know, I was thinking about this actually the other day too. You know, there's a couple songs on that album that have a rock influence. And Aaliyah started to incorporate leather into her aesthetic and stuff because she was really, she really wanted to move into a rock direction and do kind of like this rock project. She was looking to collaborate with Trent Reznor. And this project, this album, when you listen to it and you listen to some of the B-sides and, and the deeper cuts, 
you hear the beginning stages of what it was that I think she was trying to lay out for herself in the next project that was going to come. And it's so unfortunate to hear that. Mm. It's beautiful, it's brilliant, but it's upsetting to know what was supposed to happen. Right. You know, and that that is the one thing that I think is like super def is uh, devastating when you listen to it is like just you could hear like oh she was she was dropping little hints for what she was trying to do like try to make the um, transition as smooth as possible you know by by adding different things. What song in particular are you referring to? Um, I could be what if. Those are two that I think about that I'm like, you know, those are the, like, the guitars and, and um, I could be like that, definitely. You know, you, you saw she was setting a tone. Right. And then we get the news that two months later that she's passed away in a tragic uh, plane crash in the Bahamas. You talked about in the beginning of the book how you, a friend that called you and then you started driving home just crying that your mom thought that you got into a fight with your friend. Uh, let's talk about you for, first. How did you react to the news of Aaliyah's passing? You talk about it in this book, but, you know. I didn't take it well at all. You mm. know, I, um, I had, for me, there was a lot of unanswered questions, you know, we didn't have as robust of an internet back then um, where you can kind of sit and get trapped in a Reddit board and, and kind of put all these pieces together and, and figure out what was happening. Um, so I, at the, as a fan, as a fan, as someone who was just starting to work in the music industry mm -hmm. and had all of these dreams and aspirations of working with Aliyah, getting to interview her, having all of that on a professional level, it really hurt me. But on a personal level, it broke me because, you know, Aliyah and I were the same age. And I had been following her career since the day back and forth premiere on MTV. She was, she was everything. She was like, she was like the best friend in my head. You know, and while she, as she grew up, I grew up like we grew up side by side, you know, and I say this in the book where she passed away at the end of the summer of my graduating college. And, you know, usually when you graduate college, it marks the beginning of your life, you know, the start of, you know, real adulthood. So my life was beginning and her life had ended. And it was um, I felt robbed as, as, a, as a fan. But, you know, I felt like she was robbed. You know, you 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 don't you're not supposed to question these things, but you have all these questions. Like, why her? You know, and she was such a good person. And anyone, and even in the book, when I as I um, I've spoken to so many people for the book, they all had the same sentiment. Everyone had nothing but nice things to say to her on, about her on and off record. She was just such a good person. So it's kind of like, you know, you took away Alia, and. Um, you know, I remember that night when I was driving home and I was just crying and crying. You know, I was mourning so much. I was mourning, um, I was mourning all that she'd been through. I was mourning all the things she couldn't do after that, mm -hmm. you know? And then I was mourning the concept of mortality, you know? When somebody in, you know, who's your exact age dies in a plane crash, you know, it's just one yeah. of those things. Yeah. It's just hard to it's just hard to wrap your head around. And even when I think about it now, I still can't wrap my head around it. It was it was difficult to even write those chapters, you know. It was difficult to read. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to you. I had to just skip some pages because the way you worded one phrase, I was just like, okay, let's just get, you know, the day after. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the reason why I did that was because I think we forget collectively that Aliyah was a human being and human beings die. And I think what, what tends to happen is, you know, she didn't get on a plane that, that was bound for heaven. She got on a plane that crashed. And the, the more that we acknowledge what a human being she was, the more we can uh, acknowledge what she survived on this planet. Because we don't tend to do that. 
because especially people who have met Aliyah after she passed away, they've kind of turned her into this kind of magical like being that never existed. And Aliyah mm -hmm. existed and, and she, she had a heartbeat and she had feelings and those feelings got hurt and she fell in love and she fell out of love and she was hurt, you know? And we don't, we don't acknowledge that anymore. We've taken so much from Aliyah. We take from her music, we take from her style. When there's an opportunity to discuss, you know, young girls and older men, we take from that story as incorrect as what we take is, right? Mm -hmm. So in that moment, when I was discussing her death, it was to remind everyone that Aliyah was a human being. You know, the, as much as she had an angelic personality, she was a human. So when she passed away, she actually, we, we, have to, we have to acknowledge that. And we also have to acknowledge that that should have never happened. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and yeah, can, that can seem a little grotesque, right? But- There's been 20 years of like just lies and out of the ordinary theories. I'm glad you brought the- 100%. Yeah. I don't well, like- I felt like I had to. Her name like that, yeah. A lot of people just throwing dirt on her name. Well, it's it's based it's it's rooted in a lack of information. You can't you can't attack people for the assumptions that they've um, kind of conjured up based upon the little fragments of information. I mean, we're talking about um, an online culture where you know you got Twitter accounts with zero followers who are who who exist just to torment, right? Mm -hmm. And I think. As many as those accounts are, there are so many accounts that just honor Aliyah. Like I, there's so, the um, Aliyah fan pages are so incredible. Like Aliyah archives, the Aliyah hot in Instagram page, Aliyah always. Um, I follow and, brother. Know, yeah. Aliyah yeah. Spain. You know, there's there are so many. You know, and like and and other ones like Ultimate Aliyah. You know, like there's there's so many that have. Um, I'm fortunate enough to get to talk to them too. Like even, um, you know, free Aliyah's music, the, um, to get Aliyah's music out, you know, um, Aliyah's history. Like there's, there's just these accounts that, that exist to just keep her legacy going. And, you know, I don't want to say that like every time you log into the internet, it's just always something negative about Aliyah. I think it's actually quite the opposite. I think when, now, we're in a world where when you log on, you still see Alia's face and you still learn something new. And as long as you're able to do that, then her legacy is still going, going strong. Right, right, and thank you for that. And we do need the Leah Hive out and active because we don't ever want to forget her. Not me, not you, Never. not anybody. If you're mm -hmm. a fan of music, you want to remember her forever. Definitely, definitely. 20 years uh, after the tragic accident, how is her family holding up? I, I'm, I don't know. I, um, you know, they're keeping her legacy alive in the best way that they can, but you know, you know, grief is, um, grief is nonlinear. You know, you can, you can lose someone two days ago or 20 years. And, um, I don't think the hurt ever really goes away. So, you know, as someone who's experienced tremendous grief myself, um, I give them a lot of credit for getting up in the morning. Right. Yeah. Especially if someone as close as they were. Like her brother described her as like literally her best friend, as his best friend. So Absolutely. You, know, you never know what each well, you never know what each new day brings you. But you know. No, no. Uh earlier we talked about her music, you know, it's a it's a funky situation, like with the uncle and everything. Uh have you heard anything? regarding her music being released this year? Um, I don't know about this year. I mean, I hope this year. I do know that um, there's been, you know, multiple instances where um, I think people are bidding on the, the rights to release the music. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know the current status of that kind of bidding war, um, mm -hmm. but I know whoever is the lucky label is, is gonna be really lucky. <laughs> I understand, and I will be on the lookout for it because I'll be streaming it because I have nothing better else to do. 
Like, what, like, what the hell? <laughs> well, I mean, that and it's an amazing catalog. Yeah. Kathy, I know you got to take off. Thank you for joining the show today. Uh, first, before you take off, can you let people know where they can purchase this book and where they can follow you on social media? Sure. Um, Baby Girl, better known as Aliyah, in stores now. You can get it um, Amazon, Target, Books a Million, Borders, Barnes and Noble, Walmart, any um, independent uh, booksellers. You know, please try to um, if you if you can find an indie that has it, uh, black owned, woman owned. Just you know, grab it from there, and uh, also available on ebook and audiobook and. Um, you get to hear my Jersey accent um, on a couple parts of the audio narration, but the rest is done by the incredible Bonnie Turpin. Nice, 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 nice. All right, and final question. As you were writing this book, did you see, did you sense anything? Did you see any signs that maybe her spirit was around guiding you? Always. You know, helping you write this book? Always, always. Is there is there an example in particular? Um, yeah, I for a, a chunk of the writing of the book, Aliyah came to me in my dreams every night and um, would offer me hints on where to find certain things. And then I would go look for them the next day and then I would get the information I needed. Um, and not to mention, you know, um, I have a, a giant window right next to me where I wrote this book and um, I'm on a pretty high floor and, I, and there were still um, ways that butterflies were still able to come to the window um, you don't really see them fly this high up over here. And um, they were hanging out at my window. And um, even when I went to Ferncliff to visit her, I felt her there too. I, I, I you know, she's she's all around. And I, in a lot of, and you see her in numbers too. The number 22 shows up quite a bit. Um, a lot of other fans can um, attest to that. They'll sometimes see 22, uh, her age when she passed or 79, the year she was born. Um, they'll, they talk about that a lot as well. And um I, I felt those signs too. And I still see those numbers. And, you know, when I think of her, you know, I'll look up and there'll be a 22 or something like that. So I know she's around. Um, and anyone else who's kind of tapped into those things knows that she's there as well. Nice. Uh, let me just say that I wish she was in my dreams. So I'm kind of jealous of you. <laughs> <laughs> Ask her. Ask her to come. Just be like, could you say hi? <laughs> Kathy, thank you for joining the show today. Uh, thank you for keeping her legacy alive. And I'm, I will recommend this book to everyone I know. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All righty. Take care, okay? All right. Take care. All right, bye.